Welcome back to Our Fresh Story, the podcast where we have conversations about brave decisions to start over again. I'm Olivia. And I'm Jenny. And we're so glad you're here today. Hello, hello, hello. Yeah, no, sorry. I was going to say hello. Oh, you start then. I was going to say, think of the coolest person that you know. Mm-hmm. Like, like visualize, like, as children of, like, yeah. their 90s, 80s, who would be, like, the coolest person that you could think of? Rebecca Lee. It's, this is, like, literally my <laughs> answer. She's, like, beautiful L.A. actress, comedian, writer. She's, I know. Like, I feel like I would have, like, stood next to her haircut. with, like, my chubby Gap t-shirt. <laughs> and I would have been, like, she's my friend. And, like, she she's so nice that she would never have said no. Or she would have been one. I mean, she is. That's how she is. She invited us. She found us um, through the cut through our when we were in New York yeah. Magazine. And we were on her podcast, How the Fuck Did You Bounce Back? Uh-huh. Which she does a different, um, like, theme every season and we yeah. talked to her about how she picks those themes on the episode um but she's just like i was watching her while we were recording i was like how are you real like that's just what i kept thinking like <sighs> she's how are like, you real? like the epitome smart, of cool composed yeah. so smart gorgeous inside yeah. like like it just like well dressed like pitch perfect like outfit i know i feel like she needs yeah. to just take my hand and like walk me down the street i don't know <laughs> she's just so come on we'll go find some vintage t-shirts it'll right. be okay it'll be okay let's just cut anyway. your hair and dye it pink i mean she's just <laughs> olivia she's had so her cool so sweet so smart we had a great conversation with her um she's definitely like a cool check camp out. counselor that makes <sighs> you feel a little bit cooler by extension by like knowing but her. she's so nice like there's something that, like she's she not yeah genuine as fuck yeah yeah she's just yeah. wonderful anyway yeah i hope you enjoy this episode with somebody just know that every question i'm asking i'm just kind of like googly eyed looking at her the whole time while we're recording and she's an episode. artist like it's so many things yeah she's oh my just gosh. fantastic i love her i love her art too fatherless behavior is her art. We yeah talk about yeah yeah podcast. so enjoy this episode <laughs> with rebecca lee jenny's <laughs> Falling I'm apart uncomposed over there. about you, Rebecca. I don't know what to say. But uncomposed about Rebecca Lee. Um, it sounds like, isn't that like a poem? Something like a... Yeah, Annabelle Lee. Annabelle Lee, thank you. Yeah. Um, well, Jenny is uncomposed about Rebecca Lee. <laughs> I am. So enjoy this episode with Rebecca Lee. And please remember to rate, review, and subscribe to a fresh story so that we can keep telling fresh start stories. Rebecca Lee is an actor, comedian, and artist. She has her own mental health podcast called How the Fuck Did You dot dot dot, which we loved being on. She performs her live comedy across Los Angeles. Rebecca, we are so happy to have you here today. Yay. I forgot what I wrote for that bio. But then as, as you were going, I was going to interrupt you and be like, I don't know what's, what, what's going to come. But then I was like, let, let her finish. It we kept it okay. short. We kept it short. <laughs> what love that. is um, the next season of How the Fuck Did You going to be about? Right? Because each season, it's a little bit different. Yep. So the first season was uh, How the Fuck Did You uh, How the Fuck Did you Get So Confident, um, mm, which was that. all about confidence. Second season, How the Fuck Did You Bounce Back, all about bouncing back. Yep. And I don't know what season three is going to be mm. about because I just – do it based on like what I need in my life uh (laughs) and I'm so like the first season was for sure confidence because I Mm. as a comedian I see my peers on stage and they're always just they radiate confidence and I'm like I would love to have that and I don't know Mm. that I do um and then bounce back uh divorce going through divorce Mm -hmm. um and it really I think started coming out of COVID because that was really hard for me um I know some people struggled while in lockdown and Mm -hmm. while in that and of course the entire world did don't get me wrong Um, yeah but I think me specifically I am fine being inside and alone I like being alone it's lovely (laughs) highly recommend it and so then opening back up especially after you know the skills that we kind of at least I learned or the introspection that had happened across you know a a great deal of time um, yeah was kind of a reckoning for me coming out of it. Yeah. So that was whatever a long you need answer. next is what I'm, yeah. I'm curious. I know I love, I love the podcast. So I'm always, yeah. and I'm fascinated by the idea of like changing your lens a little bit every season. Yeah. It's really just what 
the fuck do I need in my life right <laughs> do now? You, do you come up with the concept and then you look for people to talk about it? Is that how yeah. it, the strategy yeah. is? Yeah, yeah. Now I'm thinking, like, maybe it'll be money. How the fuck did you get money? I would love some money, you know? Yeah. yeah. You know, I had two guy. Fr- I had a guy friend that did years ago, like 2016, no, earlier, like 15. He had a podcast that was called Mercenary, and it was all about, like, how people make money because I am also fascinated by that. Like, just how much do you make? How do you make it? How do you live? So many people, Olivia and I are like, how did, what's their life like? How do they pay for their apartment? Like, yep. I just want to know. Totally. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, it, I completely agree. And it's also one of the things that, like, I think historically we've been like, don't talk about your money. Mm-hmm. Don't talk about how much mm-hmm. you make. And I'm glad that we are kind of starting to open that yeah. up because especially, yeah. like, in the workplace, um, mm-hmm. like, like, knowing what your coworker gets because usually, listen, we're women. We're getting the short end of the stick. Uh, yep. Yeah. yeah. So, I, mean, I was fascinated yeah. while you were – You talked a lot about the strike and Mm. the strikes that went on. And I'm fascinated because I think that there's – this is totally off topic, but we'll get into it. There's so much misconception about being in the entertainment industry and that, like, everybody Mm. has money in the entertainment industry Mm -hmm. and, like, nobody has money in the entertainment (laughs) industry. And we have some friends that are, like, pretty high up in this entertainment world, like, and they were struggling during, Mm -hmm. you know, the strikes and stuff. And so – I want, you know, you talked a lot about this, but like, I was so curious, like how people survived that if they yeah. did. The strike or COVID? The strike. The oh, strike. I'm like, by the way, yes. Uh, yeah. Well, and- the actor strike is still happening. So yeah. that yeah. is ongoing and that's my union. Um, SAG okay. is my union. So we are still on strike. Um, and I, a lot of people just picked up jobs. Like yeah. I picked up a job that I had years and years and years ago to make ends meet, which is teaching art to kids. Um, no, I like, love that. so I'm doing that in like an after school program, but it's just, so it's like still kind of in my wheelhouse. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, people are picking up extra things, but there's not really any, uh, SAG has like an assistance fund that you can like apply for, but they're giving out like $500, a thousand dollars. Like it's yeah. not going to sustain you for very long, especially in Los Angeles. Um, <laughs> no. hopefully long-term it is helpful, which I'm sure it will be if they can, um, agree yeah. on anything at all. I did see, I got an email from SAG. That said, the they were negotiating like last week or something, and then apparently the execs, higher ups, or whatever were now offering less than what they were offering originally. Hmm. Okay, so they went back even further. Right. Uh, so they're they're really awful and uh, they yeah. suck. Yeah. But writers' rooms are now open, so um, that is that'll probably be six to eight weeks before any like um, scripts would come about right. or any mm-hmm. the audition process. So hopefully by that time, eight weeks, we'll have a deal. But who's who's to say? Oh, and yeah, no one. I think they said something like 87 percent of right. um, SAG folks don't qualify for health insurance and qualifying for health insurance is like, I want to say it's $26,000 yeah. a year. You have to make that in your um, in your income. And that would include residuals if we had uh, a lot of residuals, which we, go- we don't. I always have like checks for like three cents come in. Um, <laughs> big money. Yeah, big money, baby. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, the, the vast majority of people are making under 27, 26K a year. Uh, it, and that's unfair. <laughs> yeah, it is. Mm-hmm. But it, it's... Um insane the way they've undervalued the arts and and yeah. the writers and the actors and very upsetting uh considering how big entertainment is and you know how important it is to to our cultural narrative i do want to go back to one thing which is you said you were teaching art and you do have a brilliant uh i love your design stuff oh thanks it's fatherless behavior and do you want to talk about that for a second sure yeah <laughs> uh so fatherless behavior is my art brand I would love to like branch it out and to do like other things right now. It's specifically like home decor stuff, mm-hmm. wall art, that Straight. type of thing. Um, but that came about in COVID. Mm. Um, just ne- having not done art for a while, just being busy with life stuff and then now having all the time in the world. Um, being able to get back into that and started with watercolor, started back into the art world with like watercolor, which is, I highly recommend it, especially with I love any, watercolor. Yeah. With, if you have any sort of anxiety mm-hmm. or um, even like if you're not great at sleeping, things like that, mm-hmm. it's a very, I don't want to say it's an easy medium, but it is a, it's very fluid and mm-hmm. it's, it can, you can make it as easy as you want. It's yeah. not yeah. like 
drawing where it takes you know I cannot a draw much- no exactly. <laughs> no but right. watercolor you're just pushing colors around on I, paper Rebecca that's literally what I say when I'm having like a hard time and I need to ground myself yeah. I tell myself go push some color around that's like yes. literally my mantra yeah it's it's interesting we're actually we're building some activities into our book proposal that we're working on and like building in some watercolor stuff and some because it's like it's so spiritual watercolor yep mm-hmm. yep and I do feel like a lot of people are like um Oh, I could I couldn't possibly I can't do art. I'm not an artist. I yeah. couldn't possibly do it. Uh and it's like, no, I promise you, you can do watercolor. Mm-hmm. Um so yeah, so I eased back in with watercolor and then um eventually I was like, Hey, you guys, can you clean out your junk drawers and I'll just like make stuff with it because I'd love to use some of the waste instead of contributing mm-hmm. more. And then the pills kind of caught on and people liked that the most. And so now yeah. I use mostly like collage style and then um expired pills and vitamins Mm -hmm. um and it's kind of like my take on a couple different things but the pills being like the pharmaceutical and healthcare industries Mm -hmm. just to kind of draw attention to that and then furthermore a lot of my pieces have like a mental health element to it um targeting like my issues which resonate with a lot of people and that's another thing about making art is sometimes you feel really alone in the thing that you're going through or feeling and then you put out a piece of art and people are like, oh, me too. I mm. completely – I feel the same way. I want that because I, I relate to that. And you're like, oh, okay. We all are experiencing very similar things and you aren't alone in the things that you're feeling. Um, and then the name Fatherless Behavior came from – I was on TikTok and somebody – there was a woman who – a beautiful woman doing I, – I can't remember. I think it was like a dance or something. And – some fucking dude commented like, this is fatherless behavior and was like (laughs) so mad about it. And I was like, I don't have a relationship at all with my father. I relate to that and I like it. I'm going to take that word back because fuck you. (laughs) I love it. My like, fuck you. I'm taking the power back type of thing for not having a relationship with your father. (laughs) First of all, like it's your fault. That yeah, you don't have a relationship with your dad, right? Not. Like there was like yeah. daddy issues. It's like how about daughter <laughs> right. issues? Like you 1, have the kid. Uh, we had somebody once call us in a comment like silly and shameless because of what we do because of Fresh Starts Registry. They were like these silly and shameless women. And we were like, we are silly and shameless. We don't have shame. Like why would we have shame? What's there to be shameful about? And we are very silly. So I have a shirt that says silly and shameless on oh. the back. Yes, I love it. I love that. Take Two it back. great things. Silly. Exactly. And- <laughs> we love that. Anyway, what is it like? You're in LA. Is that yes. right? Yep. And what is it like there today? What's the weather like? Gorgeous. Yeah. A little warm, but not a cloud. Typical LA weather. Not a cloud in the sky. Probably like 70 degrees mm-hmm. right now. Beautiful. Um, beautiful. Beautiful. Nice. And how are you doing today? I'm doing well. Um... Let me think about that. I, I was almost like, let me response. check my calendar and see <laughs> how I'm doing. Like, those are related at all. Uh, no, I'm doing well. Um, I actually get to do a little bit of acting work tomorrow because there is, like, sketch work is not under the, the mm, SAG okay. contract that is getting negotiated. So that's why SNL is back. Oh. Um uh, so I get to do my first thing in a long time tomorrow, which will be great. And then I'm getting out of town and going to a music festival in Vegas. Uh, nice. so I have a fun next couple of days. So not that doing things is equals happiness, <laughs> but it is nice to uh, sometimes yeah. get out of your normal routine sometimes. <laughs> yeah, no, totally. it's true. Well, perfect. Why don't you take us back to the beginning of your fresh start story? Yeah, there are. I was thinking about this as I was laying in bed last night and as an artist um, in many different ways, I I was thinking like I take a lot of risks uh, just being an artist in general, especially being an an onstage performer, um, doing a lot of improv, right? You're taking a ton of risks all the time, but not only Mm. that, like just you have to bet on yourself a lot uh, in my career and, and I think the more you take risks in life, the more you're going to have to have a fresh start because you're going to quote unquote fail sometimes. And I put it in quotes because that's not a thing. Like Mm -hmm. failing is not a thing. I've never learned from um, success. I have only learned from failure. Yeah. And so I was just like, oh man, the more you take risks in life, the more fresh starts you'll have. So I was just thinking of all the ones that I have, but I think the most recent one that comes to mind um, is 
my divorce, mm. uh, which was interesting. Um, and I say that because I was only married for two years, which mm. is not very long. And a lot of people have a lot of opinions on that. Um, so I was married for two years, um, October of 2020 to October of 2022. Um, yeah. Um, and nothing really happened that was a big thing, which mm-hmm. is like another tricky issue in a relationship or when a relationship ends and no one did any huge, yeah. there was no dramatic right. thing that caused it. It was just two people who couldn't get on the same page. Um, and I think that kind of started happening or we started noticing it in 2020, in the beginning of 2020 as lockdown started. Um, and I think the first thing that happened was my therapist at the time was like, hey, I think that you would benefit from going to CODA, Codependence Anonymous. Mm. And I was thinking about my youth and growing up, and I have a dad who is a narcissist or had like diagnosed narcissistic personality disorder. I have a mom who is a textbook codependent. Those two usually go together. So the relationship that I saw um, was very polarizing. Mm. And I tend – and I took on some of the the, – codependent traits and so if you if you are interested in in learning more about it there's like these there's the criteria of determining like am I codependent or not and there's one section that is a lot about control which when I think codependent I kind of think people pleaser but that's Mm -hmm. not always the case um it's a lot about controlling the other person's emotions reactions responses so that you are kept safe Yeah. yeah um and so the more I started going to meetings that were online, this was, you know, during lockdown, um, the more I just started re- realizing different things about myself, about my past, about what I want in a marriage. Mm-hmm. Um, and it turns out you're allowed to have needs in a marriage. Like, what? Who, I didn't know this. Who I know. knew? I know you're hearing it for the first time. I know you're wild. hearing it for the first time. We found wild out at about shit. the same point, to be fair, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I know we talked about this a little bit on my podcast. Um, but, um, yeah, and so, okay, I now have needs. Great. They're no longer – I'm no longer existing in this marriage right. to serve your needs. I now, mm-hmm. I now have my own needs. Let's chat about it. Maybe they align with yours. Maybe they don't. Um, so that's when we started couples therapy. Um, we had two different cu- couples therapists over those two years. The first one was like, she was fine. She was fine. But there was no like real progress that was happening. It was it, it, it was a good sounding board, but she didn't chime in. It was just more like a space for us to talk. Yeah. And she kind of stayed out of it, uh, which is, I don't know. That's, that's one way to do it. Uh, <laughs> and so when I was like, you know, there's the progress is not being made here. Uh, let's switch. And mind you, one of the things that kind of pushed us apart was he's so chill and that's great. We love that. But like to a point where it's a detriment, like almost to the apathetic point. Mm. Um, and this is not to talk. He's a wonderful person. We're still friends. We still work together. Uh, but so I'm the person finding the therapist. I'm the one getting Rex, you know, I'm doing the legwork and, Second therapist was fucking great. Um, she is from the Center for Healthy Sex in Los Angeles. I think they're based out of Santa Monica. They have a really mm-hmm. great book. Um, it's like daily – or they have a great email list too. It's kind of the similar things, but they, it's like daily affirmations, uh, different um, like excerpts, excerpts from books, um, mm-hmm. self-help or otherwise. And then like at the end of each – newsletter there's like three things that you can do alone or like with your partner um and so we found someone out of there and she was just so fucking good like there was homework there was the like the hard questions um Mm. and through that second therapist we really were like okay oh no you know what the the like one of the last sessions my ex-husband was like I'm never going to be able to give you what you're asking of me. And the thing that I was asking for was just more intimacy in general. Mm -hmm. Um, Just whether that's emotional, intellectual, spiritual, physical, all of Mm -hmm. that. 
Um, and he was like, I, you know, I don't think I'm ever going to be able to give you what you're asking. And I'm like, okay, well, thank you for your honesty. My therapist was like, okay, Rebecca, that's a very, it's kind of the, the, the straightest shooting thing that he has said in our, <laughs> in, you know, while working together, yeah. what are you going to do with that information? And so I was like, okay, well, I have three in my head. I have three options. I can say, okay, I don't have, I don't need to have these needs anymore. I can work with what you're offering or I can go, okay, I can hear you and hope that you'll change or I can leave the marriage. And I decided it went back and forth so many times. I feel so bad for my friends because you know, when you like chat the same friend, uh, their ear off about the same thing and you're Mm -hmm. like, listen, I know we just talked about this exact thing, but I need to talk about it again. And I need to hear you. I need that reassurance. I need to hear again. I need to talk it out loud. Um, and so I went back and forth and then eventually I was like, okay, this, this has got to be done. Um, and that, I, it was interesting. Signing the divorce papers was the hardest thing to do in the process. Um, and it was so funny because he could do it. He did it so easily. It just was so – and that's not to say he wasn't sad or upset. It was just so representative of, like, who we are as individuals. I swear he could have been, like, writing a grocery list. Like, it was just like, oh, yeah. all right, and here we go. And yeah. there you are. And I was just like, oh my God, it took yeah. me so long sitting with my therapist on Zoom and just talking through the thing and being like, okay, just take the pen. Okay. We're just going to hold the pen today. Like that. Mm-hmm. Type of wow. Yeah. Um, and, but once it was like sent in, it felt a lot um, easier. And I got to stay in our apartment, which, you know, pros and cons to it. I tried mm-hmm. to it and make it my own um but it did have I did it was less of a change than what he went through which is very funny another thing is uh he lives in an apartment that I found on Zillow like I you know it's just Mm -hmm. so representative like and then when you're out of it you're like oh I see these little things that like I didn't see before and again they're not huge things they're not yeah big dramatic things you're just two different people not on the same can't get on like not being yep. able to get on the same page, you know? My really ex long. used to say, because um, it was similar, and I know we talked about it in your podcast, he used to say, so what? We're not on the same page. We're in the same chapter. And I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's good. We're in the same chapter. We're in the same chapter. But, like, that's not enough. <laughs> it's just not close enough to, yeah. to be on the same page. Yeah. That is an interesting phrase, though. That's very interesting. I mean, it was helpful to keep me there for a while longer. Sure. So, <laughs> I don't know. I mean, you talk about it as much as you want, but I'm curious, like you planned a wedding during COVID and you talked about a little bit about like how you were kind of the, the doer in the relationship. You were the one that made things happen. What did that feel like? Were you, did you feel very lonely in the wedding planning process? Like, because you were kind of the one that made things happen in the relationship? Um, honestly, I not, I didn't think about, about it really there were just too many other things and like I love like a part I designing a party or like I love everything about it I would I don't want to be an events planner because I can't do it for other people I don't think but like (laughs) I love picking out that like I Mm -hmm. just love it I love picking out flowers I love tasting (laughs) food and so like he would come to everything you know it's not like I had to drag him he'd be like Mm -hmm. okay like I feel like there was an SNL sketch for the one Chat. back with Pete. Yes. Yep. I know yes. what you're talking about. That's the one with Adam Sandler in it, yeah. right? Yeah. He's in a bu- – there's a bunch of them. There's oh, one with Kim- he is. There's one with like, yeah, J-Lo, I think, Kim Kardashian maybe, where he's just like, okay. Yeah. 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 <laughs> They're okay. like, here's your dad. Don't you want to talk? You've never talked to him before. And he's like, okay. Like, he's yeah. just so like, <laughs> yeah. Do you yeah. want to say anything to him? No, nah, I'm good. Yeah. All right. Okay. And like, that is how it felt. It was just like, okay. Yeah. You got, you planned it. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, and so like, yeah, I, d- I didn't feel lonely cause I just really liked yeah, p- the process, but maybe if I had stopped and had time to think about it. Um, yeah. but I think yeah, also maybe because it was during COVID times, it was a lot of like, are we going to be able to have a wedding? We yeah. don't know. It was back and forth checking the, the regulations and things like that. And we ended up kind of being like, fuck it, let's elope. And then later on have a party. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah. Yeah. 
COVID changed a lot of things for a lot of people. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, can we go back a little further though? Because first of all, like how long were you together before that point? Uh, only three years, which I don't know. I guess that's, that seems like it's, so it's, it's five it's, years in total, the whole thing. So 2017 to 2020. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. I mean, it's so, 2022. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. No. So like, what was the impetus for getting married? And like, was he the one that like, pr- like proposed and like that, or is that something that you came to together? Cause it sounds like you held a lot of the load of everything. So where did the engagement come from? Yeah, I think like a lot of people my age or any age, I guess, but you start like sending ring things to your partner. I like this. I like this. And um, he did it and he proposed. (laughs) This is not. And again, this is not bad. Like he's a wonderful person. I have to keep saying that because he really truly is. Yeah. But like he's just proposed... not your person. No, like, yeah. yeah. He's that's okay. he's a wonderful person. He's just not my person. But like he proposed like in our living room like with the TV on. Like I don't know. It just it was like a very chill. Right. It makes total sense for him proposal. Right. Very like okay. Right. Proposal. Yeah. Right. Um and he was thrilled and I was thrilled and there's a lot of emotion and all of the things but that he did take the lead on on the proposal and everything it just it was a very chill proposal and like the more I get to know myself the more I'm like I'm just not a chill person as <laughs> much as I I would love to be a chill person. Yeah. That's just not me. I feel things very deeply. Um it makes me great at my job. It's not always great in life. It's definitely something I have to uh, see a therapist over, take medication mm-hmm. for. Um, but I do feel things very, very deeply, and I'm just not chill. And so, yeah, as much as I'd like to be, it's, it's just not in the cards for me. But that's no. a codependency thing too, right? Of like, like I was, you yeah. know, shrinking yourself to fit and and making sure that yeah. you are you have no needs and and denying the fact that you're chill, like. I, I think, you know, our stories are not dissimilar and I spent so many years being like, I don't need anything. Oh, you don't need to do anything f- to propose. It doesn't need to be this. It doesn't need to be that just because I wanted to make it easy to love me. Cause I, I, I think I believed somewhere that I wasn't easy to love. And so mm. I wanted, and so my control, my codependency, which I now see how I sort of white knuckled that whole relationship, um, you know, it's all about sort of making it easy to to be with me because you don't really believe that. Why would they stay if you make if you're your true self? For sure. Yeah. 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 I also think like when I got in my relationship with my now ex husband, I was coming out of um, an abusive relationship, mm-hmm. a physically and emotional, emotionally abusive relationship with someone that I lived with, um, and. So I had come from pure chaos. Yeah. Uh, and my ex is exact that is exactly who I needed at the time. It, yeah. that is exactly what I needed. a safe, stable, chill, um, reliable person. And that is who he is. Uh, but there you can there can be a middle ground. You can be cool, calm, and collected mm-hmm. and still in touch with your emotions. And you know what I mean? There, It doesn't have to be one or the other. Yeah. I always say like my ex was not scary. Like he was never scary. I was never scared. I always felt really safe. And I thought that that was what you, I thought that you sort of exchanged that for like deep emotion. And so it was yep. either like deep emotion or stable and safe. And I yep. didn't know that you can just find somebody that is like nice and like good person and like also has worked through their shit. And has a lot of emotion but they don't yeah. have, like i i thought it was a trade-off that you make and it's not why do we think that i don't know what's a good well, question go- i mean i'm gonna assume and i was gonna say this goes back to being a child with two parents that have their own stuff going on you often have to hide who you are to just survive your childhood right so you can't feel the things totally deep you can't be the, the wild artist kid that you are because it's never about you and nobody really wants to listen or care about you. And so we perceive love then as just surviving and being quiet, right? And pushing our needs down. Yeah. So by the time we get to like 35 and we're like, but actually we're like a witchy woman who has all these like feelings, right? Like 
then our entire, and I know this was for me, my entire worldview was like thrown because I'm like, wait, I'm not actually this brooding, dark, like quiet child. Like I'm a really out there woo, like, you know, all these things. And, you know, tip uh, for me, and maybe this is true for you, I was kind of like that at maybe ages three, four. By the time I hit five, it was like, boop, like, you got to kind of like, you know, and so I do a lot of inner child healing work to try to go back to that little girl because she was crazy wild girl, right? So I don't know, how do you feel the relationship? And do you have, like, did you do a lot of healing about your childhood after your marriage ended? I still think that's something I need to work on. Um, and we all do. Right. Yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah. I, I relate so much to that. Um, the, the parents thing, because having a narcissist for a father, you, there's really only two ways you can do things. You can either do it his way or you're wrong. Like those yeah. are just like the mm-hmm. two, the two options. Yeah. And so you end up doing it his way because of course you want love and affection. And if you, if you don't do it his way, that's going to be withheld. Um, and so I grew up like not being the person that I really am. Like you said, yeah. um, I think for me, it manif- it started more so like in when I was 10. So like a lot of this shit that went down with my dad started at the age of 10 for me. And I think mm-hmm. that is the age um, where I started to have to be somebody else. Um, yeah. so like middle school and high school, I really was not myself. I would have done more arts, be more. And I was still in the arts, but I would have been way more in the arts than I was. I kind of followed in my sister's footsteps. I did cheerleading. I did, you know, I did a lot of the, the things that, that my dad wanted me to do. And I was in the IB. Did we talk about the IB program? I don't know if I talked about that. No. no. Oh, it's like – it's kind of like Montessori but for like high school. So it's like you're yeah, doing the same cool. curriculum as everybody else from around the world. It's like a – um, you have to like apply to get it. I don't know. It's yeah. like a whole – it's mm. a whole thing. Um, and then you end up with like a, a shit ton of college credit. It's kind of like AP but like yeah, a little bit different. What, international baccalaureate. That's what it yep. is. Yeah. A yep. lot of people at NYU did it. I, yep. Yeah, so I'm familiar yeah. with it. Yeah. So like I did that um, and I graduated and then – that my my major was kind of decided for me, which it ended up being business, but because that was the world that my dad uh, was is, and that was the path for me. And I was like, all righty. Right. I hated college, hated it. I went to a state, uh, University of Florida, so a really really big school where it was very sports and Greek mm-hmm. oriented, mm-hmm. and I was in the sorority for like I don't know a semester or two. Um, and then I was just like, ah, this is not for me. I'm doing all these things because my sister did all these things because I saw yeah. that my dad loved it when my sister did all these things. I graduated in three years because I was like, I can't stand it here. I would rather just like double down on classes and get through it. Um, and so it wasn't until I moved out of the state uh, when I was 21 um, that I started to find myself and I moved to Colorado Strange choice. Um, not that there's anything wrong with Colorado. It was just like, <laughs> why? Do you know anybody there? No. <laughs> I was just my boyfriend and be like, this seems cool. Um, but it was there that I started doing like the in the performing arts again. So I went to the Denver Center for Performing Arts. I um, did their curriculum. I started doing – there's a really good like uh, college for film in Denver. Um, I started doing like student films mm-hmm. and – I had a teacher be like, if you want to do this for real, you could absolutely go do this for real. You just mm-hmm. have to choose New York or LA because it's not here. Um, and so then I chose LA. But it, yeah, it wasn't until I moved out of the state of, of Florida where I'm from that I really started to mm-hmm. find myself. And God, it's so important to get in touch with your inner child. If I were to say that I'm the two things I'm working on right now personally, it would be finding my inner child. In finding more tenderness. And I think those kind of go hand in they hand. Do. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, because I just – another polarizing thing, right? It's either you are tender and you get walked all over or you're strong, opinionated, and a bitch. And, like, mm-hmm. there is no in between. Mm-hmm. Um, and because my I saw my mom and my sister, who are both tender-hearted people, get taken advantage of, my mom fr- from my father and my sister's life – 
um, I was like, okay, I have to protect them. So I'm going to do the other one. I'm going to yeah. do the strong, opinionated, bitchy. I use bitchy because it's not really bitchy. It's just like yeah. what in your head, what you think yeah. is right. one of the, the two options. Um, and so now I'm like, okay, there is a middle ground. We mm-hmm. don't have to be on one end of the spectrum or the other. Mm-hmm. So those are the two things I'm working on. Again, I think they go hand in hand. Well, what is Brene Brown says? Soft belly, strong back. Mm. And I love that. And it also goes with my personal motto. I'm not yet Brene Brown, but like I say when like you give good to get good. And if you don't get good, then you've learned something. And so like it's just all like it's but, you know, so much of that, like you said, exists in nuance and exists in the middle ground. And you have to kind of be willing to like float along and be like, I'm going to give this person good intentions and my best motivations and I'm going to give them you know, a beautiful plate of, of warmth. And if they smack it away, like that doesn't harden me. That just gives me some knowledge. And, you know, but that's hard. That's hard to sort of start living in it that is sort an, of And we don't give enough. Um, we do not talk culturally. This is my favorite phrase. We don't talk about, but we really don't talk about really- what it's like to be raised in a household walking on eggshells all the time. Mm-hmm. And it is actually... I know now from a lot of the work that I've done and now because I'm trained in hypnotherapy and all this stuff and I've done a lot of this work. Yeah, it's amazing. And I I learned so much about the nervous system. When you're raised in a household that you're constantly walking on eggshells, your nervous system never calms down. So you're in constant fight or flight. So how are you supposed to become a person, right, and know who you Mm -hmm. are and find joy in what you enjoy doing and be tender to yourself if you are constantly trying to survive, right? And it's not that we are consciously trying to survive. It's that we're subconsciously trying to survive, right? So our body is just like primally trying to get through because it doesn't know the difference between our dad being an asshole and a tiger coming after us, right? Right. And so I think that – it's it's so connected that tenderness and the inner child i mean it all goes back to are we worthy right are we worthy of being loved are we worthy of our voice being heard and i think probably like you getting up on stage and doing all your the thing, stuff is is so healing to you did you find that like getting into acting was part of the healing journey oh yeah i think like again like my sensitivities uh are my superpower and Mm -hmm. like both for my career and in life I I, it's so interesting I I bet you guys get this a lot too but like do you get people like come like not even on the podcast just in life telling you a lot and they're like I never told that to anybody before or like some version of that our whole time our whole life that's literally why I got trained because I had people coming to me all day asking me for advice. And I was like, I'm ethically not really like trained for this. Let me go get trained as a a certified life coach because I didn't know how to hold. I knew I could hold the space, but I didn't know how. So yeah. 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 And so, uh, fuck, I forgot what the question was. (laughs) No, but about healing. Getting on stage and healing. Oh yes. 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 yes, yes. Uh, and so my sensitivities are, like I said, I think they're my superpower. Um, so it makes me a really good performer. It makes me really good. Um, I started it more doing more like theater and drama. I transitioned into comedy because it was so healing. And it is something yeah. that like when we're going collectively, individually, as a couple, whatever, going through yeah. a hard time, watching something funny is really helpful yeah. for a lot of right. people. And it's a, and it just is helpful to watch. It is to do. Um, mm-hmm. it's helpful to experience that for me, but also like hearing other people laugh and know that they're experiencing it. It's, yeah. it's a wonderful thing. It makes, uh, my sensitivities also make me, um, very good at like what we call like moment to moment work, whether that's in a play on stage on set, whatever, but like doing improv specifically, it's really one of my strong something that I'm very strong at is like being able to just be there with you. Well, I'm not surprised and I'm going to keep, I'm going to keep going back to this, but I'm not surprised by that because to survive a childhood with a narcissist, you have to be able to read the room immediately. Yeah. Right. And so we, Jenny and I are the same. We can go into a room and read the energy immediately. We always joke as soon as somebody comes on the podcast within the first millisecond, we can tell how that podcast episode is going to go. Right. And so I'm sure you can do it too. So, 
it probably makes for you to be a fantastic, not to mention you're brilliant. Like you are a very smart person, like, <laughs> which is very clear talking to you. Now we've, we've talked to you a bunch of times. We've, you know, but you just are very knowledgeable. And I think that you have to be very smart to be a very good comedian. And mm-hmm. that's something that is like, I don't think people talk about that. Maybe they do. I, I don't know. Yeah. But like, people do talk about okay, that. People do talk about, but, like, <laughs> but like, you have to really understand people to be mm-hmm. a good comedian. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I can also, yeah, I can read the room too. It, it, and I can like, if some, if I get a bad vibe from somebody, I'm like, no, no, I, I, I can see it from a mile away, yeah. even though nobody, and that's an, another frustrating thing about, I guess about life, but I can only speak to living in LA specifically is like, I can sense, okay, they are here to network, which there's nothing wrong with that. If you're here to network, you're here to network. I would love to do better at that. But like, I can sense if they are here because they think you can give them something or because they yep. genuinely want to talk yeah. to you. Yeah. Yeah. And I can see that easier than other people can see it. Yep. And so that's a frustrating thing being like, how can you guys not yes. see this? Yeah. Yeah. It's lonely. It gets right lonely. It's, it, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Totally. It does. Totally. Yeah. I, yeah. I was just talking to my, my mentor about this and saying how when you vibe at a higher level than other people, it actually can be incredibly lonely because you sometimes feel crazy. Right. And you feel like, Mm -hmm. like, oh, wait. And I was thinking about all the great artists and and people of our time. And I'm like, no wonder they all turned to drugs and drinking. Like they were lonely. Like they felt crazy. And Mm -hmm. it's just so interesting to think about. So after your divorce, um, you know, you, you did a lot of healing, you got into acting. And so where are you now? Like what's coming up for you next? I mean, well, we're in a strike right now, so (laughs) nothing currently. Yeah. Um, But I think I just – so because my ex is also in comedy, I stayed out of comedy for most of this year. Mm -hmm. Um, Like since the last October, Mm -hmm. so a year ago. It's only been Mm -hmm. a year. Yeah, Yeah, it's only been a year. Um, Only, but a lot lot has happened. A lot happens in a year. A lot happens in a year. Mm -hmm. Um, People get engaged after like – a month. I, I, I digress. I'm, I'm going to stop to start talking about something. Else. Okay. Um, uh, uh, but I stopped performing because we also had a live show together that we started. Um, and once, you know, the split happened, but even before the actual divorce papers were signed, yeah. um, I just, I stopped doing that show. He, he kind of asked me to stop doing it, which was you know, I think I think when you're the instigator of ending the relationship, you're yeah. kind of willing to give up more than yeah. maybe what you would want. And so, you know, since I was the instigator, I was like, he was like, you know, he he was like, I kind of just want to do this show from here on out without you. And I was like, oh, yeah, of course, of course, whatever you want. And now a year later, and it's blown up too. It's like a very, very popular show in Los Angeles. I'm like, I really wish I wouldn't have given that up so easily. Um, but I guess, yeah, I, I think, guess that's what you, at least that's well, what I did. it's not your story anymore. You know, I don't know if that's an instigator thing. I think that's the story you told yourself, but I think yeah. it's the story of being a people pleaser. Like, yes. You know, I didn't instigate my breakup, but why did I leave all of the furniture and the rug my brother got us and like all of this stuff? Because I didn't want to interrupt his household. Like, I think yeah. it's just that you're so used to deferring to that person because that's what maybe will make you feel the love one day is if you keep deferring to them. And so you're just, that's the pattern. Yeah. Yeah. So I bowed out of that show. I, I just started doing live shows again within the last two months, I would Mm. say. Um, and it's so nice and it's, I'm really finding my own comedic voice again. You know, when you're dating someone who's in the same scene as you, you, and he was, he's older than me. So he was already there and established before I was. And you feel like this person, you're just his, this person's girlfriend, you know, you're Uh not like your own person. (laughs) Right. And so now that I'm not attached to another comedian, I'm like, oh, I get to find my own voice. I'm like experimenting with various show ideas that haven't been done before. And that's a very exciting and um, scary thing because you're like, well, I don't know if this is going to work. It's never been done before. And maybe that's because it shouldn't be done uh, if it's ever (laughs) been done before. But we're going to find out. Um, So it's like tying different things into um, improv and comedy that traditionally haven't been done so like 
the last show I did was called Musicians Doing Comedy. And it was based on the fact that um, a lot of comedians that I know wish they were rock stars and a lot of rock stars that I know wish they were comedians. They were um, just talking so- about this on Smartless. Oh, really? Uh-huh. With what Paul did they Simon. Say? With Paul Simon. Because Paul Simon was saying how he has a lot of friends who are comedians. And then Jason and Will, you know, were saying that they wish that they were rock stars. So, yes. Yep. So I started, like, a live show. And I had, like, real musicians who've never done improv before come and do improv. I had improvisers uh, play instruments. And we just all kind of that. meshed together. And it. it was really, really fun. But it had never been done before. So I was like, okay, I don't know if this is going to work or not. Um it was great. It was lovely. There were some hiccups and I learned a lot from it. It was not as scary as I thought it was going to be, which is always um, something I feel like you discover when you do something new is like, oh, all right. Well, I wasn't, I mean, maybe just because I have anxiety and I'm like trying to predict what's going to happen in a space where nothing is scripted anyway. So there's no way that you could <laughs> predict it. It's a very hard arena to even try to predict. Yeah. Right. Um, But so, yeah, I think my focus right now is just getting back into live shows. And I have a couple other ideas with like incorporating poetry into improv um, and more like music stuff. And so, yeah, that's kind of my trajectory right now is just live stuff. And maybe that's just because I haven't been thinking of anything else due to the strike. Yeah. Um, So, yeah, that's kind of that's kind of my focus. Do you write also? I can't remember. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, That's all. Yep. So, um, writing, actually my writing partner is my ex-husband. Um, so, but we did one, so we started a a pilot, I don't know, years ago before COVID that will be our like last probably like written project together. Um, I have like a new writing partner that I'll work with, but second person we've had on this podcast that has had that. Uh, really? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Their writing partner for the pilots and stuff was their ex. Yeah. Yeah. Well, they were married and then they split up. Yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. How did they, did they keep writing together? No. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so like, but like this pilot's too good to like, yeah, to give up. And I think I kind of probably learned from the giving up of the live show that I'm like, yeah. okay, I'm not going to give yeah. him mm-hmm. this pilot and yeah. let him take my hard work. Not that he's a taker, but you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, so yes, I this will be the last project that I work on with him most likely, and then I have a new writing partner. So still, yeah, still doing that. Um, just staying creative in general is super important, and then doing like the internal work of yeah, you know, healing. And I still have such a long way to go. I've been in therapy since 2015. Um, I, I had not to have never taken any breaks, uh, and I still have such a long way to go to like work through the trauma and be compassionate for myself. Um, and a lot of that inner childhood and hypnotherapy. I, I have a friend who's a hypnotherapist and she gave me a session and it was a a very, it was a very inner child session. I'm curious. Is it, is that traditionally how hypnotherapy goes? No, I mean, yes and no. So there's like hypnotherapy in general is just subconscious reprogramming, right? So there are a ton of modalities and a ton of different like schools that you can, uh, you know, ascribe to. So I'm a neuro-linguistic practitioner and a hypnotherapist. And so there are, and I'm, it's funny, as I'm talking to you, I'm like, oh, what could I do with Rebecca? Because there's like, there's other things you can do. There's like time techniques, which I'm trained in. And that's basically going back to the root of uh, when you, when your first time feeling fear, shame, guilt, all these things were, and, and getting learnings from them and then reprogramming how your body um, is uh, filtering them. Right. So there's like different modalities. One of them is an inner child. <clears throat> I just, I'm actually doing my own sessions with my mentor as well. Cause I wanted to make sure I fully understood what it felt like to go through these changes. I just did an inner healing last week and it does bring up so much stuff. It's really powerful when done with the right uh, practitioner you know, I was going to say to you, part of like starting that journey is just keeping a picture of you as a little girl, like with you all all the time. Smart. You know, and just like looking at her, I actually have like a little handprint of mine I keep up in my room from when I was in kindergarten, like remembering that that's the same body, which is like a really weird thing to think about. Right. But, you know, um, hypnotherapy or neuro linguistic stuff, which by the way, you would love because it's all words and language and like using that to reprogram people in a positive way cool. um, is 
in conjunction with therapy is incredibly powerful work because you can't really like um, sidestep the subconscious work. And so a lot of this, like, and for me, you know, I did a lot of therapy too. And then I was like, there's still something here. Like I'm, I'm not being as, I'm not as successful as I want yet. I'm not. And like, there's definitely a worthiness shit with me too, with our own parents divorce and stuff. And so <clears throat> working with my hypnotherapist, you know, she gives me subliminal audios I listen to all the time. And like, even just before my ex-husband emailed me and I was like, and like triggered me. Right. And I was like, I'm going to put a subliminal audio on with my like learnings that she gave to me of like, I am worthy. I am confident. Right. And it like calmed me down. Right. So there's the subconscious work is um, up and coming for sure in conjunction with a lot of the other healing. And I'm also on medication too. Right. So it takes a, it takes a whole village of yeah. things to yeah. keep us yeah. keep us going. Yeah. But I yeah. would say, you know, the inner child stuff is it's hard because it, it is emotional, right. It's really mm. emotional. Mm, yeah it's, yes and I relate to being like well I've done therapy for a really long time but like there's a little piece that I need to yeah. there's uh, something I haven't touched on um or touched yeah. on enough and I that and that makes sense because a lot of therapy is traditional talk therapy I guess there's some like cognitive behavioral therapy in there but like yeah. most of the therapy that I've done is just we talk about things, but we don't, it was not trauma specific. I mm -hmm. also have wanted to try, what's the I, the I one? E EMDR. EMDR. Yeah. That one seems interesting too. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's supposed to be very powerful. I actually am like scared to do that one. <laughs> I have a friend too, who's in LA and she um, did some breath work with somebody who's local. And she said that was Huge. Yeah, they, she did it hypno breath work. She did it for her, like business coaching, and she had like gone to a business coach, and then she also did this, and she was like, it was way for that business coach like wasn't success for her, but the the breath work technique was huge. So that makes know. sense. It's Same like yeah. you know we don't we're like oh it's just a we're talking. But it's also like, no, like it's in your body. Like trauma is like yeah. in your body. It is. Yeah. It is. And your brain is in your body. Like it's yeah. an organ. Like it's all. And it's you all carry connected. around generational trauma, right? You carry yep. this from so many places. Yeah. No, for sure. So Rebecca, if somebody's going through a big change or a fresh start in their life, what would be some wise words you could impart to them? Yeah. I would say like, you know, you best. Um, you know what's best for you. I know that when I was going through my divorce, I was looking to a lot of other people mm -hmm. to give me reassurance. And it's not, it's wonderful to go to people to get their thoughts on it. Um, but at the end of the day, you just got to dig deep and sit with yourself mm -hmm. and, you know, what's best for, you know, what's best for you. And my therapist was like, okay, let's talk about kind of like the pros and cons of each. And it was more like, what can you live with easier? Like they're both hard options. Mm -hmm. One, you're going to pay a lot up front. It's like, she, we were using car metaphors, but it's like, you're going to pay a lot up front and less over time. If mm -hmm. you, you know, end the relationship, if you stay in the relationship, you're going to pay a little bit over a long period of time. And you yeah. have to decide which one is best for you. Mm -hmm. Like they're both going to have really, it's, they're both going to be hard yeah. in different ways. Yeah. So what can you live with yeah. easier? Mm -hmm. And I thought that was, that was really helpful for me because I think also growing up the way I did, there's an element of perfectionism in there and it's like, well, what's the right thing? Yep. Well, what's the right thing? There has to be a right thing and a wrong. What's the mm -hmm. right one? Yeah. And it goes hand in hand with the nuance thing that we were talking yeah. about. And I, I, do think we live in a society that really wants things to be binary. It's either right or wrong, black or white. Mm -hmm. um, married or divorced. Married or divorced. Yeah. There's no room for nuance. I think social media has caused, has, has unfortunately helped Polar the, mm -hmm. the polarization. Yeah. Um, because it's like, how are you going to talk about nuance in such a tiny mm -hmm. capacity, Box. you know? Um, yeah. And I think just realizing like there is nuance and, and knowing that everybody is – when you're asking for advice, which totally is helpful to talk to people, but they're coming in with their own thing. So mm -hmm. like a lot of my married friends wanted me to stay married. Mm -hmm. A lot of my divorced friends wanted me to get divorced mm -hmm. because they want to justify their decision mm -hmm. that they made in their life. Yeah. So you also have to realize like what they're coming in with. Yeah. You yeah. know, no one's coming in 
a hundred percent neutral here. They're all coming yeah. in with their own stuff. Um, yeah. And then, yeah, but that, that's the major thing I would say for me that was helpful was just like sitting with myself, doing mm-hmm. all of the quote unquote research, talking to people that reading the things, talking to the people and then sitting with myself and being like, okay, I did the work. Now what, what is it that I need? What do yeah. I need? And it's not wrong to prioritize your needs. I yeah. think growing up the way I did also being a woman in society, it's like, our needs are usually put last, especially mm-hmm. I think mothers. I'm not a mother, but I can imagine mm-hmm. that your needs are put behind everything else. Um, and it's not bad to have needs. It's totally healthy and normal and that's okay. And don't feel bad. And um, yeah, I think those are like the, the the major things that come to mind and having a support system um, and knowing that like it's – truly going to be okay. And you're not alone going Mm. through it. You are not alone. If you need to be on medication, I am the biggest advocate for if you need to be on medicine, get on medicine, man. Mm -hmm. It's okay. I know there's a lot of fears around it. Mm -hmm. What if I get addicted? What happens if I need to get off of it? (laughs) Well, if you're doing this with a medical professional, I promise you will be taking, you will be going slowly hopefully it's somebody who's going to start you with the slow the Mm -hmm. lowest amount Mm -hmm. of the thing Mm -hmm. and then go up from there if you want to try supplements first totally cool then move up that's awesome but it's nothing to be ashamed of and if you need it you need it dude sometimes it's situational you won't need it again sometimes it'll be for me it'll probably be a lifelong thing and like i'm fine with that it's okay you know life is fucking hard man Mm -hmm. life is hard yeah, I love. I mean, a- yes, a hundred, hundred percent. We're big fans yeah. of medication here at Fresh Start. Yeah. Um, and Rebecca, what was the last thing that you ate and truly loved? Listen, <laughs> <laughs> lean into the microphone, guys. <laughs> Listen, I don't eat meat, and I have walked down the aisle, the frozen aisle of like the non-meat, mm-hmm. whatever, chicken nuggets and all that shit, and I've always seen these corn dogs. That mm. I don't know if they're vegan or vegetarian. They're one of the two. And I'm watching a dog, my neighbor's dog, and she's out of town. And I went in her freezer. So I was like, mm, what's what's happening over here? I don't know. That, I guess, is that a thing that everybody does when they like, <laughs> Other go to people's somebody else's pantries? houses? Yeah. Yes. Like, hmm, yes. Hmm, what have they got food. in here? <laughs> yeah. uh, and they had the corn dogs that I've never purchased because every time I've walked by them, I'm like, no, I can't. Yeah. I can't possibly. That's too right. indulgent. I can't possibly. <laughs> and then I saw them and I was like, oh, the $6 fuck dollar yeah. box of corn dogs. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I was like, oh, fuck yeah. Let's because I, I, I didn't know. God damn it. Are they good? They are mm. good. Mm. Uh, so yeah, <laughs> these frozen vegan vegetarian corn dogs. Amazing. That sounds really good. Amazing. Corn dogs are well, good. Uh, they're so good. Corn dogs are so good. Corn Rebecca, dogs are you are so good. Uh, corn dogs are good. Uh, yes, you are um, amazing. You're wonderful. You are a shining star. And we are so, so, you know, just happy to have you in our orbit. Yes. Uh, and that we connected about a year, almost a year ago now. Um, oh, man. Now. Um, but, you know, uh, we're just excited to see what you do next. You are so mm-hmm. brilliant and wonderful and kind and, you know, just open to the world. And I think that that's the most important thing you can be. So thank you for being here. Oh my gosh, thank you for having me. That was so wonderful. Thank you. (laughs) Thank you for listening to today's story. We're always here and we're so proud of you. A Fresh Story is produced by Fresh Starts Registry, the first and only platform for everything you need to begin again. You can read the show notes and learn more about today's episode at afreshstory.com.